from Aswan, or more specifically, Elephantine Island. So Elephantine Island is actually an island in the middle of the River Nile. Despite the fact that it is technically just an island, it does actually make up part of the city of Aswan. We didn't quite realize this when we ended up booking the accommodation. And so we kind of rocked up. We got a transfer from the airport to this, can we even call it a terminal? A ferry terminal. Mm. Basically just like a glorified bus stop, which happened to be portside. Um, yeah, it had like a dock. Yeah, and like a set of very small benches. And we waited for this boat to come across, pick us up, take us over the other side. Thankfully, which takes all of maybe two minutes moving at a slow pace. But thankfully it's only like five Egyptian pounds per person, which is peanuts, really. And so, then yeah. we were met by our host, Kasim who brought us to our accommodation, which is called Nuba One. Mm -hmm. And as you've just seen, it's incredible. It is absolutely massive. And it appears that we have the whole place to ourselves. The kitchen is fully stocked. It has tons of space to spread out the living room, dining room. The air conditioning in our bedroom is top notch. There's a washing machine that you can use for free. They have clothing lines for you to hang your laundry. They have a rooftop terrace with a view overlooking the River Nile, and it's all an amazing price. So cannot speak highly enough of this place. The island to me feels like I'm not in Egypt. I feel yeah. like I'm on a remote Caribbean island, maybe. It just seems like a different way of life. There's no roads, no yeah. cars. It's just sandy walkways between the buildings. Yeah, and there's only maybe a couple of little markets where you can pick up groceries and the rest is all just kind of restaurants and things like that. I think there's maybe a resort or two around here, but that's very much just self-contained grounds. The rest of this kind of little town is just little dirt paths and all that kind of stuff. It's which is, so relaxing yeah. and lovely here. It's just a different way of life. But uh, it is also worth bearing in mind that unlike in Cairo, where it's kind of around mid to high 30s, actually here the temperature has been clocking in the low 40s. So I think this is probably the hottest that you and I have ever experienced so far. Yes, it's good preparation for our next countries. Let's see how this goes. It's going to be pretty intense. Um, considering the fact I've been kind of ill for the past few days, let's see how we will hold up here. But today, we are going to be taking the ferry back across to the mainland, if that's what we should call it. And we're going to be going on a tour of Philae Temple Complex, the High Dam, and the Unfinished Obelisk. So. Let's go get the ferry. This is the site of the unfinished obelisk in Aswan. Now, obviously we know ancient Egypt has a lot of buildings that were made of incredibly sturdy and durable rock. You're talking about limestone, sandstone, and granite. And now of course, all of that had to come from somewhere. In the case of granite, then that came from quarries like this here in Aswan. The stones were already pre-cut into the shapes that were intended and then they were then transported up the Nile which really still isn't that far away from here. Obelisks were huge tall stone objects that were usually placed in front of temples and they would stand in pairs at the entrance. This particular obelisk is thought to have been commissioned by Queen Hatshepsut for the temple of Amun in Karnak. However, unfortunately it was never completed because there were flaws in the obelisk. There's a huge fissure and so it was just abandoned.
We've just arrived to Aswan High Dam. The tickets were 100 Egyptian pounds each, which works out to be about five Canadian dollars each. The Aswan High Dam is the world's largest embankment dam. It was built across the Nile River between 1960 and 1970 and it largely eclipsed the lower Aswan Dam which had been built in 1902. So the purpose of this dam was to better control flooding and also to help store water for the purposes of irrigation and finally also to generate power for hydroelectricity. In terms of the structure it is absolutely huge so at its base it's just under a kilometer wide but on the top it's about four kilometers so in terms of an overall structure this was a huge feat of engineering. There is a lot of political history that also went on behind the scenes with this with regards to funding, more conflicts between Israelis and Arabs, all of that kind of stuff. And it's unfortunately way too much information for me to take in and regurgitate in a time that would be conducive to a YouTube video. But the downside to this though is that this has actually had a bit of an impact on some of the historical sites that have been around this area of the River Nile. Uh, so as a result of that, structures such as the Philae Temple, which hopefully we're going to see later on, and also the Temple of Abu Simbel, which we hope to see later on in our travels in Egypt, ended up actually having to be completely relocated by UNESCO to make sure that it was above the floodplain. We are now on Philae Island, which is home to many, many extremely well-preserved temples. The first of these was built during the 25th dynasty, which was between 800 and 600 BC. So a number of the things that you're looking at here are nearing on 3,000 years old. The first of those was built by the Egyptians, and then over time, as Egypt entered the Ptolemaic era, so when it was ruled by Greece, then far more temples and structures were added on, and then the same with the Roman Empire as well. Because of the fact that actually this served as something of a border between Egypt and the rest of Africa, then this was also extremely well guarded and strong border garrisons were set up along this island in addition to these amazing temples that we're about to explore. on this island are dedicated to the ancient Egyptian goddess Isis, including the one behind me, which is the Great Temple of Isis. This is one of the most important buildings on this island. Isis was the ancient Egyptian goddess of love, healing, fertility, and many other things, which made her one of the most important goddesses in ancient Egypt. This temple was built by multiple Ptolemaic rulers. As you can see, it's absolutely massive, so it would have taken a long time to build. I'm currently stood in something called a birth house. Now, this is a small temple that used to be built in front of the main temple and this was usually a feature of greek and roman temples in this particular instance this is a temple dedicated to the birth of horus who was the son of isis
just about finished going around the temple complex of Philae and we're sitting in the kiosk of Trajan right now. But what are your thoughts on it all? I thought the unfinished obelisk was cool to see in most instances things like this where it's the finished article and it's beautiful, it looks magnificent, but um, you never kind of see much about how it's made. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was kind of like an ancient version of a how it's made documentary. Yeah. And I thought that was that was really neat, especially since that quarry really contributed granite to the entirety of Egypt. So you can see stone that came from there going everywhere. Mm -hmm. The dam was fine. I don't think it was worth the money, if I'm completely no. honest. Um, Not to sound spoiled, but no, I agree. Like, I mean, we paid 100 Egyptian pounds each, which, don't get me wrong, isn't a massive amount of money, but you would have thought, considering the significance of it, that there would be a bit more of an actual, like, visitor's center or just a bit more information about it all um just to kind of inform you a little bit more about the context of um how everything was built and why it was built and so on and so on but really we just got a few information boards so we kind of ended up having to rely on wikipedia to try and figure out what was going on so that wasn't the best whereas this though this is the jewel in the crown, really. Like, if you're going to be coming to Aswan at all, then this would be why. It's worth the added journey across the Nile in order to get to here, because, like, honestly, you could spend the best part of the day on just in this complex alone, really, I think. If you're going to spend your money and time doing anything in Aswan, Philae Temple Complex is 100% worth it to come here. The history is incredible, the hieroglyphics that are preserved are amazing, and also just the panoramic views and being able to go across the Nile is pretty cool too. Absolutely, and yeah, I think the great news is certainly with this and a number of other things we're going to get to see over the next few days, then like this is going to be some of the best preserved Egyptian ruins we're going to see. So just seeing this on its own makes me really excited for what's going to come. Yeah, definitely come here. We stopped by the grocery store on the island after our tour and we've cobbled together some lunch and dinner. As you would expect, the selection at the grocery store or mini market, if you can call it that, isn't extensive. So we got ourselves some mango juice, some pasta and tomato sauce for dinner. For lunch, we are having some chips, some croissant and a Kit Kat bar, and then we got ourselves some coffee for this afternoon to keep us awake because we're feeling tired and for tomorrow morning. After having our random picnic lunch, I think we're feeling a little bit more energized again. Yes. We've cooled off from the sun and have gathered our thoughts on the day. For me, it was a little bit of a weird one. We ended up taking a tour, which cost 900 Egyptian pounds each, which I think is about 40 Canadian dollars. And it included the major sites that all of the big tours go on, whether you're flying in from a different country and doing like a week or two week long tour in Egypt. These are the three major sites that they include. And we obviously did it by private car. I don't actually think the price of the tour was that unreasonable because I did some research and contacted a few other companies and this was by far the cheapest. I should say it didn't include the entrance fees. So we did pay an extra 300 Egyptian pounds each for the Philae Temple Complex. But again, that was including the boat ride over to it and back and 300 Egyptian pounds pounds is what like $15 each which based on anywhere else in the world that actually seems like a reasonable price to go into such a huge historical landmark. What was strange and weird for me I guess was having come from Cairo and Giza where the sites are so huge and big and our tours there took all day. I think the shortest one was maybe six hours. Yeah. We left here at nine in the morning and we were back by just after one. So I think for me, it was hard to see the value in money of paying that much money for a four hour tour. But then when I think about it, Cairo is the biggest city in Egypt. Of course, everything is going to be closer together in Aswan. And also Giza was 
the capital of ancient Egypt. Aswan, yes, it definitely has some historical significance, but still not to the same extent that we experienced in Cairo and Giza. So everything's just going to be on a smaller scale. So I think I needed to reset my mindset about that. And also I'm thinking about the money we spent and it was actually far less than we spent in Cairo and Giza. So in proportion, it was cheaper, but my mind is always like, well, how could we have saved more money? And it seemed like the only option was this like tour by private car. We actually didn't have a tour guide with us. We did just have a driver. So if you wanted a tour guide, it would be more expensive, but there's no way you couldn't do this without some kind of private transportation, whether that be you're on a big tour that has a bus or whether it be by private car, because the distances that you're covering, despite it being a smaller area, are just way too far to be walking. It's just impossible. And of course, there's no public transportation. So you are limited by that fact. You're going to have to pay for some kind of private transportation or even with shared transportation, you're going to be with a lot of other people. And these things are just inherently more expensive than when we were, say, in Italy and you could just walk around by yourself. We've managed to get into a few kind of awkward scenarios with regards to this whole kind of tipping culture and people asking for money as well. There are some things to be conscious of. Yes. Um, because it isn't as bad or dangerous as people have told you, but certainly there are still ways that people try and hook you into paying extra when you shouldn't. One of the first things that we ended up finding, and this has been kind of the same between like some of the aspects of Cairo and also some of the things that we found today. There are generally people that you can spot from an absolute mile away who are selling whatever it is under the sun, drinks, hats, scarves, whatever have you. You can super from a mile away. They offer you something, you say no thank you, and generally speaking, it only takes maybe one or two attempts and then they're gone. That's actually been surprising because I thought that it was going to be far worse. Exactly. And here, really, you can just say no thank you and they accept it. Yes. But I think the thing that surprised me the most is the fact that around these places that are security guards or high security, whatever it is, these people kind of come around and they ask you where you're from and then they start to kind of just point out things that maybe they think you've missed and you think, oh, wow, that's really nice of them. Or in the case of when we were at the Memphis Open Air Museum, like they offered to take a couple of photos of us with some of the kind of major sites in the background and all of that kind of thing. We and just... then they wanted to be in the photo with us. Exactly. And we just thought, oh, isn't this just lovely? They're going out of the way to make it a nice experience. And then the instant that they gave me my phone back, then they ask for money every time. If it's just a street seller, who you can tell is just a street seller trying to get the money off you, that's one thing. But I think the shocking thing is, it's the fact that these people are meant to be there, well, in my mind anyway. Anybody can tell me I'm wrong here, that's fine. But surely the point of the security is to prevent that kind of stuff from happening. I think it really has taken me by surprise the fact that these guys are there to maintain order, to stop people getting scammed, or at least I think they should be. And yet they're kind of getting in on this kind of action themselves to make a quick buck, even though they're already definitely getting paid, I imagine relatively well, for the jobs that they're already doing. So that has taken me a little bit by surprise. And then there was a slightly awkward moment just as we got out of the car from today's tour. We ended up stopping up, up just beside the boat stop and the driver then turned around to us and in very, very broken English, basically kind of alluded to something, something driver. And obviously we were a little bit confused and we ended up getting into a thing where we exchanged stuff via Google Translate to try and understand what the heck he meant. In hindsight, maybe we shouldn't have even entertained it, but basically it ended up being that he was asking for a tip, even though he's already getting paid. Yeah, we didn't understand because, as we mentioned, we're paying him quite well for the tour, which wasn't really a tour, it's him driving us around for four hours. So we didn't understand why he wanted a tip in addition, because what we're used to 
is that if you pay for a tour, you don't have to tip on top of it. Right. However, if it's a free walking tour, of course you're tipping because that's their payment. I guess also our expectations were kind of set with our experience at Pass Sam in Cairo as well, who we did pay him a little bit extra, we did tip him a bit, but that was because he really went out of his way to make sure that we were comfortable, to make sure that we skipped the line on certain things. He had so many connections. And he did speak English very well with us, whereas this guy didn't really interact with us at all. No. And Hossam got us water and food, and he arranged dinners for us at the hotel. He really kept us safe. He properly took care of us, which, yeah. considering the amount that we were paying, you would hope for that kind of service. Yeah. So there we were, expecting something like that from this new guy. We definitely didn't get that. Don't get me wrong, it's a very plush and comfortable car that we ended up sitting in, but... And he that was, was it. perfectly nice, yes. and he took us to the places safely. Yeah, no problem, but he didn't... Like, he kind of just waited in the car while we went and paid for the entrance fees, and it just seems like, based on the service, there was no need to ask us for a tip. Yeah, considering we were already paying a decent amount. Exactly. So, um, yeah, it just, it's been a weird day, like you've mentioned, and I think that in particular just really got my goat and left a really sour taste in the mouth. I still think that Egypt has been far less crazy and Agreed. busy than I expected based on what people told me beforehand. Yes. I feel like I've been completely left alone in general. Yeah. No, I so I still have a positive feeling. Yes. I think because my expectations were so low going in, Same. but it has been a bit of a strange day. Yeah. And for me, it's more so just been like my expectation of what I was going to be seeing today. Mm -hmm. And then versus what I did see was smaller, took less time. That for me has been the strange part today. Yeah, and I think also, you know, up to now, Egypt has been great. Like, we have been very well taken care of. The hospitality has been second to none, and everything that we've seen has been, like, once-in-a-lifetime stuff. So, definitely don't get us wrong. We're not ungrateful about being here. We really do love what we've seen, what we've experienced, and we would definitely recommend, like, the majority of the aspects of being here, because this has been really good. But, you know, our channel is to recommend things, and that doesn't always mean necessarily recommending the positives. We're also trying to give you additional tips and additional things just to be mindful of so that you get genuinely the best travel experience imaginable. So apologies if it seems like we've had a bit of a moan here, but certainly we just want to be completely transparent with you all. But I think that's pretty much it for our day, and we're just going to think short for the rest of it now. Yeah, we, I think you've probably had enough of our voices for today. You probably have. We've waffled on. But also, we do have to get up pretty early because tomorrow we are going to go to a very special site in Vida. We can't wait. So tune into that one as well. But until next time, take care. And keep smiling.